So for those watching on YouTube, I'm recording the speed run really late. So I'm going to do a, a slightly shorter game and analysis. But obviously, the plan is for the quality to still be as high as it normally is. So we're going to play 10 plus 0. Now we're 2051. So obviously, the moves themselves are going to be made more quickly. I'm going to have a little bit less time for explanation during the game. But we'll have plenty after the game. We get the white pieces. Let's go with 1e4. We're playing Caleb Miller. From England, 2030. Okay, we haven't actually faced e5 in a very long time. And we've been carrying out two openings. Obviously, the Vienna is one of them. The Four Knights Scotch is the other. Let's see how the Four Knights Scotch uh, holds up at this pretty high level. So first, we develop all of our knights. And after knight f6, we strike in the center with d4. We've had great success with this opening so far. And let's see what the higher rated peeps can show us here. Now, it's pretty amazing. We have not even once faced the main line here, which is e takes d4, knight takes d4, and then bishop b4. We faced ed, and then knight takes d4. We faced, I think, d6. This guy plays a pretty decent sideline, bishop to b4. This is an okay move. White is slightly better in this line, and we should respond not by playing de, which allows knight takes d4, but by pushing d5 and grabbing some space. I play like this sometimes with black because it's basically a line that forces white to close up the center. And so it gives black chances to play for a win. But from a spatial perspective, black is obviously worse. Okay, so again, we don't want to play knight takes e5 here because of knight takes e4 with pressure on the c3 knight. So instead, we develop our bishop and protect the d3 pawn, taking the sting out of knight takes e4. And of course, we're also not afraid of bishop takes knight. Because yes, the pawn structure is going to be damaged, but in return we get the bishop pair, and we also get the possibility of supporting our center with c4. Okay, so here we can castle, obviously. We can also play the move h3 in order to limit the development of this bishop, but typically bishop g4 is not particularly worrying in this type of position, because black is rather passive. So in response to bishop g4, we could respond with h3, chase the bishop back, and we could even play g4. Okay, so our opponent plays this a little bit differently. Yeah, he knows what he's doing. This is actually the right setup for black with the knight coming to g6. So again, it's a closed center position. And we've had this type of position all, quite a few times already in the speedrun. And one of the key takeaways is that when you have a closed center position, the value of each individual move is greatly diminished. You can do a lot of different things in a lot of different orders, but the bottom line is that you have to have the right setup and the right general plan. So there's less of an emphasis on each move individually and more so on, on, on what it is that you're aiming for in general. So we're going to start by playing h3. Now I'd like to prevent the development of this bishop. Other good moves that would improve our position are definitely c4, which I'd like to play right now. And just to reinforce the d5 pawn, maybe insinuating that we want to play c5 one day. Our opponent is playing this very confidently. I have to give a lot of credit. So we're just going to continue developing our pieces normally. Bishop g5 is a move which would catch a lot of people's eye, but then black will play h6 and, tri and uh, chase our bishop away anyway. So let's just start with bishop to e3. And now we've completed our development and we can start operating on the side of the board where we have an advantage, which is of course the king side, because on the queen side, we're never going to be able to play c5. On the king side, we have more pieces assembled and we've got several interesting types of ideas. So I'm going to try to carry out a plan, which I'll be doing rather quickly during the game. Then after the game, I'll break it down step by step, assuming that it works. Okay, we start with king h2. The idea of this move is both prophylactic and aggressive. The prophylactic component is actually to prepare a response to knight h5, which is a rather nasty idea in this type of position. Now, the knight is coming to f4, so the move that we want to play is g3, but we would not have been able to play this move were it not for the placement of this king. We would have walked into bishop takes h3. So this is a rather common defensive idea. Now, why else did our opponent play knight h5? Well, presumably, he's thinking about going f5, but tactically, that move fails. If black plays f5, I think we take on f5, black takes back with the bishop, we take again on f5, and after the rook takes, sorry, none of my, oh my god, I cannot draw arrows right now, f5 takes, 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 and then we play g4 at the end of the line, forking the rook and the knight. 
The drawback of putting the knight on h5 and just chilling there is that our queen is x-raying the knight. So on the next move, we could move this knight off of f3, which is something that I wanted to do anyway, because we are trying to execute the f4 pawn break eventually. So we could do that at some point and chase the knight away from h5, because it has to go back to f6. And then we could push f4 anyway. So we, we essentially gain a tempo carrying out the plan that I had in mind when playing king h2. It's entirely possible that even if black had not played knight h5, we would have still played g3, moved the knight away, and played f4. So unless black makes this happen tactically, chances are knight h5 will merely throw oil onto the fire. So yeah, f5, e takes f5, and then e4 is a tactical possibility for black. Then we just take the knight on g6. And I think when, when all is said and done, black is going to end up a pawn down. Probably that's the lesser evil. Like after f5, e, f5, there's this common pattern where black pushes e4. This kind of idea exists in the, uh, it's an old line in the Marshall in the Rui Lopez. It's not a good line, but, but, but this type of idea exists that we just take the knight there. And h7 hangs. And once black takes our bishop, then we can just recapture on d3. So I don't think black will be able to restore uh, material equality there. So already black is kind of at a loss. Like, I don't know what black should do. If you look at the other side of the board, it just nothing's going on there. And that's part of the reason that we put this pawn on c4, just to make sure that d5 is nicely reinforced, that there's no shenanigans. Like if black ever plays c6, we can essentially just ignore because of how well protected d5 is. So all of the action is happening on the king side. We're both fighting for positioning and territory on the king side. And I think we're winning the battle just based on how long our opponent is spending on this move. Yeah, black probably should go back to f6. I don't know what black should do here, honestly. Maybe knight back to f6. Some of you might be worried about queen e7 to d7 attacking h3, but that is actually nothing to worry about. The knight can drop back to g1 in such cases. And this is another defensive idea that is not too uncommon, uh, dropping the knight back to g1. And later the knight can go back to f3. An important thing to remember when you have a, a pattern like this where you've got a knight on g1 that's holding a pawn, let's say, on h3, you might look at that and say, well, this is very passive, right? The knight on g1 is tied down to the protection of the pawn on h3. That's true, but look at it from the other side. The queen on d7 is also tied down to attacking the pawn on h3. So as long as the knight is on g1, the queen is on d7, and both pieces are rather passive. But... The moment the queen moves away from d7, the knight is free to go. So it's almost a two-sided arrangement where neither side benefits. But we're more than happy to spend our night. Okay, that is, that's a funny phrase because you can like spend your night doing something. But use our knight to protect the h3 pawn and keep black's queen at bay. He moves the knight back to f6. Okay, this allows us to continue carrying out our plan. Now, we need to be careful, because if we play knight d2, then actually we walk into queen to d7. And in that position, we can play g4. In fact, we would have to play g4. But the drawback of pushing g4 in this position is that the f4 square is severely weakened, and then we will never really be able to push f4 as we wanted to. So I think a very interesting idea here is actually to play knight g1 preemptively with A, the idea of protecting h3, and B, the idea of preparing f4. Now, we're not ready to play f4 yet. Okay, our opponent would not have seen queen d7 because he basically pre-moved this. Now, just because you make a move with one intention doesn't mean that you need to close your eyes and blindly follow through on it. You need to understand how your opponent's move has impacted your plan, and perhaps you have new plans that are possible based on what he did. I think that's the case here. f4 has a, has a very severe tactical flaw. If you play, well, there's certain openings where this kind of thing happens. E takes f4, g takes f4. Black can counter strike in the center with f5. And notice that the bishop on e3 is x-rayed by the queen. So e takes f5 there leads to a bunch of tactics which don't look too appetizing for us because our king ends up very weak at the end of the line. So how do we fix that? Well, we can play knight e2, as some people are suggesting. But the fix isn't to apply more defenders on the f4 square. The fix is potentially to protect this bishop in order to take the sting out of the later move, f5. But we, we aren't in time for that, because if we play queen to d2, then black swings the knight over to c5. 
And then F4 doesn't work for a different reason. There, black takes on F4 and the E4 pawn is hanging. So I think we actually need to switch our plan a little bit and for the time being to abandon the prospect of F4 and to go a little bit differently on the king side. I think that we should consider the move H4. And you might be like, well, this comes out of nowhere. Well, it doesn't really come out of nowhere because the pawn on G3 is supporting the, the advance of the H pawn. Now, some of you might worry about the sack on H4. There you just have to calculate a little bit. Knight H4, G H4, Queen takes H4 check. We simply slide the king over to G2. And notice the defensive role that the knight on G1 plays once the knight in that position moves away from D7. Black will not be threatening the very powerful check on H3 because the knight on G1 is securing that square. What do I like about the move H4? Well, there's the straightforward idea of pushing H5 and knocking this knight into like oblivion on h8 then there's the nice byproduct of the fact that you know now our knight can move away from g1 and we no longer have to worry about the weak pawn we still have to worry about the, you know queen getting to h3 but it no longer comes with a capture we get the g5 square potentially as a as a semi outpost for our bishop in certain cases so i just think this is a healthy positional move and we're not necessarily abandoning the idea of playing f4 although it becomes a lot less likely if our pawn is on h5 because once we push h5 pushing f4 is just going to severely weaken our king and we would only do that if the circumstances were just right knight c5 our opponent is playing great okay so i think that we should consider pushing h5 we can also yeah let's start with h5 and then we'll think i don't think this move can possibly hurt Okay, so I think knight h8 is basically forced. And then I'm actually thinking about what we, what, what we should do afterward. Knight f4. Okay, I will admit I completely missed this move. Does it work? Let me calculate. Takes, check here. Takes. Bishop c5, bishop g4, bishop b2. Oh, he also has, oh, it's queen g5 check. So that's a draw. Huh. Incredible move. I think it works tactically, but it doesn't win the game or anything. We don't have to take the knight. We can also take here first. Maybe that is the solution to our woes, to take on c5 first. Huh. I need to think for a little longer here. Man, they don't make these 2000s like they used to. Okay, there, 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 there. I think we should play bishop c5, actually. Okay, let's go. Bishop c5. Now, queen h4 is not checkmate because the pawn protects that square. Now, there's a very specific reason I, I wanted to take there first. Now, I think we can play gf. Now, I think we can get away with gf, although it is very close. It, 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 this is like move for move. You have to calculate this right or you lose kind of territory. Okay. I think, I think that we can take the knight. King g2. And now the idea is queen f3. Now this is a terrifying move to play. I'm terrified here. I'm terrified here. There might be some, some tactical detail that I'm missing, which wins the game. I don't dispute that i mean that's entirely possible but i don't see one and i think move for move we might be fine here and this has been a very very tough run the last couple of games in the speed run now there's there's a, a ton of of calculational details that stand behind this these these decisions that i just made one of them is that if black plays bishop g4 right now there's queen takes pawn and bishop h3 looks like it wins the queen, but no, our knight comes around, takes the bishop, and simultaneously protects the queen. If black tries to give perpetual check with a queen g5 check, king h2, and then go back to h4, that very same knight can block the check from that very same square, knight h3, and if black develops the bishop, the queen drops back to g2. The line goes on, but I think we emerge up a piece, so I'm just not seeing the knockout blow here. Of course, it's a different question, like, okay, but... Wow, f5, okay. F5. No, this doesn't look that scary to me, actually. Because I think we can just take the pawn. I think we can just take the pawn. 
I mean, it's still it's still very, very scary in general. But I think we might be on the way to consolidating here. Okay, so what do we do? There's queen h3, but then queen g5 check is, is very nasty. No, I think we have to take. We also could have played rook a to e1. But I like the prospect of trading the bishops. Obviously, the more pieces we trade here, the less powerful the attack. On the other hand, trading the bishops has a negative, which is that it allows the rook to get into the attack. And it things get pretty scary. I think that it's worth biting the bullet here. Now rook g5 checkmate is the threat. So let's bring our knight out in order to defend the g5 square. I think that's an only move. Like allowing... Oh, we, we did have rook f to e1. Rook g5 and then ducking away on f1. But there, the problem with that was this move queen h2 at the end of the line. That looked scary as well. I think that we should... King is like the captain of the Titanic. We have to sink... You know, we have to die with the ship here. And and I want to keep the king on g2 as long as possible. Now it's surrounded by a lot of its own pieces. So we've got friendly forces all around the king side. The rook protects the knight. The knight defends g5. Tactics, let's calculate. Here, check. That doesn't... Ooh, queen g2. No, it doesn't work. Rook g1 comes to mind to open up an escape route for the king. Rook e1 also comes to mind. I'm going to go rook e1. I think for the first time in this entire game and in this entire sequence, we have the luxury of just sort of making a, you know, just a general improving move. Now, you might look at this and say, well, why rook e1? What is the point of this? The point of this is simple. You're just getting a rook onto an open file. There's no profound idea here. I'm just trying to make improvements to guarantee better chances of a successful defense. Okay. Now we can continue improving the rook with rook e6, but then we're abandoning its counterpart on h1, making it impossible for the knight to move. What do we do? Rook e4 is interesting, but then g5. Man, let's run. Ah, uh, that was a bad move, actually. Maybe not bad. Actually, that was, an, that was an interesting move. King f1. It's a safe move because we're entering time pressure. Again, for those watching on YouTube, because it was so late when I started this game, I started at 10 plus 0. Lower counterplay. And this was my idea. Rook to e6. Because now if black plays g4, we can give a check on g6 and pick up that pawn. So we're defending using tactics. And you can feel that black's attack is starting to fizzle out. The queen and the rook are fully stuck on the king side. Suddenly black's king is now very weak. But we need to continue playing accurately here. I'm going to play a move completely by intuition, which is queen to e4. I can sense that we're very close to delivering checkmate to black here. But we might need to be very accurate. Huh. I'm trying to figure out what we do if black plays g4. Insanely enough, I don't see forced mate. But I see a very promising idea there. Suddenly we're the ones going for checkmate. And black sees it. Okay, I'm going to go for my idea, which is to give a check. And now to dive into e6 with the queen. And my idea is if black takes the knight, that's not a check. We check on c8, king e7, rook e6, mate. Which is a mating pattern that you should kind of be familiar with, where like, okay, never mind, forget I've said anything, but now we're winning. Now we're winning in a, in a variety of ways, but you have 48 seconds, you're sitting there, you're trying to calculate queen c8. I'm going to play queen c8 because I'm a professional. Actually, queen c8, rook e8, so it doesn't even really matter in what order you do things. We can start by giving this check, then we take on g4, and we eliminate... That pesky pawn, and we win the game. Now we're up a full piece. We're threatening this devastating check on g8. And so by extension, we're forcing the queen trade. And once the queens are traded, okay, then we can finally breathe. We still need to play quickly. But now it's a matter of, wow, that's another great move by our opponent. But now it's a matter of converting and a matter of technique. We're no longer at risk of getting checkmate. Let me think for a little bit. Okay, I think we can get away with this move. Let's get our rook involved. Let's get our knight involved. Check. Trying to play accurately here. I'm, not, I'm trying not just to flag him and knight g5 wins. And now we go for the ladder mate. Okay, I think we can just take the rook. Wow. Turned out to be a really interesting game, actually, despite the shortened time control. Whew. That was, uh, that was nerve-wracking, I have to say. Definitely mistakes were made in the tactical phase of the game. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. The accuracy of the game, I know people like for me to check. 
the accuracy of the game was 89.4 to 79.7. So actually not, not bad, but clearly some inaccuracies were made. The funny thing is I've never really faced uh, this Bishop B4 line. I, I played it with black just sort of casually, so I'm I'm not entirely sure what the theoretical recommendation is with white. I know that d5 is a, a well repu you know it, it is a it is a decent reputation, but it's not the only move. And looking at opening explorer, let me check chess space really quickly. Since this is like the opening speedrun, I want to make sure that I'm not, you know, I, I want to make sure that I'm telling you accurate opening information. So in this line with bishop b4, which by the way is a very good line for black, if you are a e4, e5 player, this is a line that often slips through the cracks, even with experienced four knight scotch players. Okay, so I'm going to turn on stockfish and I'm going to see what uh, the recent games can tell us. Okay, so apparently the best move here is not d5. It's actually knight takes e5. See, I didn't know that. And here's how this goes. If black plays knight e5, de, and knight takes e4, white has a very, very powerful move here. Now, this is an idea that you see in a bunch of different openings. So, for example, there is a Sicilian line called the pin variation, which is now out of fashion. I mean, nobody plays it anymore. The pin variation goes knight f6, knight c3, and bishop b4. And the way to refute the pin variation is to push e5. And after knight e4, it's the same exact idea, queen to g4, forking the knight and the pawn. Now here you have to know some tactical details. You play queen takes g7, and this construction is a lot less scary than it seems. I think for newer players, you might say, wow, you're allowing a discovered check. But as long as the queen is far enough away from the knight, there's nothing. Because if the knight moves back, you just play c3, and you block the discovery attacking the bishop. Incidentally, in the pin variation, the only thing you have to know is this move a3, attacking the tail of the discovery, which is something I say very often. When you're trying to disarm a discover check mechanism, a lot of people instinctively pile up on the piece that's moving, but often the way to do it is to pile up on the tail of the, the piece that's giving the check, because that way, no matter where the knight moves, and the knight has no way of delivering a check, you'll be able to take the bishop. Once the bishop moves away, now the rook is poorly defended, and you can play bishop h6. After queen e7, I think the best move is to do the same thing again. If you're watching on YouTube, you can pause, try to figure out the right move. And it's not b4, because then you relinquish the attack on the knight. You want to keep this pawn on b2 so that you'll be able to take the knight. The move is actually knight to b3. But if you understand the theme, this is an easy move, because you hit the bishop. If the bishop moves, you just play bc. And then at your leisure, you can play queen takes f8 check and win the exchange. So that was a bit of a detour, but it's it's a common theme, this, this queen g4 motif. Very similar position, actually. Here it works a little bit differently. It works no worse than it does in the pin variation, because if black takes here, you can play queen takes g7, but as a simpler option, you can actually straight away take the bishop. The knight is forced to move, and you can swing... Sorry, no, not there. You can swing back to g4. And basically... Black is in big trouble because he's poorly developed. G7 is hanging. And black is really suffering on the dark squares. Because here you have bishop h6. And if black plays g6, then you can just bring the bishop out anyway. I mean, just this is disaster for black. So there's some more lines here. Like black has d5. But then you play queen takes g7. You can lo look at the rest on your own. So that's the reason why knight takes e 5 is good here. Black has to play the immediate knight takes e 4 and here things get very tactical. Um, actually, queen e7 is also a move here. If knight takes e4, you still play queen g4. Oh, so this idea is actually the way the way to play the line. Knight c3, queen g7, or cafe. You play this exactly like a pin variation. a3, bishop a5. And here, apparently, the best line is knight c6, dc. Now the same concept again. Queen back, attacking the bishop. Forcing the queen trade. And at the end of the line, you play the simple and very powerful bishop d2. You're going to win the knight back with interest. You're going to be a pawn up in the resulting position. Actually, maybe not, but you're just going to have a better end game in the resulting position. Because in this position, computer moves h4 with the idea of rook h3 and rook e3. White is better because we have better pawn structure. Black has these doubled pawns. And you can find a nice little safe spot for your king on f2. And you've got basically an easier pawn majority to mobilize on the king side. And black has more pawn weaknesses and worse coordination among his pieces. If rook a e8, by the way, you can just play f3 to disarm 
the discovery against White's King. It's a forced line that's actually important to know. Finally, the main move is for Black is Queen E7. And here, you lift your queen up to D3. Defending, defending. Knight E5, D E, queen takes E5. Finally, the smoke clears, and white is just slightly better here. Bishop D2, castle's king side, castle queen side. And you have basically a very nice version of a center game almost. Like if black plays d6, then you can play f3 to reinforce this pawn. And then you basically start the king side attack with g4 and g5. So, and here, if black plays bishop c3, bishop c3, queen e4, I think some people might be curious. At the end of the line, we pick up the pawn on g7 with a relatively small but very stable advantage in the end game. You have the bishop pair. Again, you have better pawn structure. I would be more than happy to play this. So I learned stuff too. And the best move is actually not d5. It's knight takes e5. But in the game, we decided to go for a close center. I think this position is probably very close to being equal. Sorry about that. I think this position is very close to being equal. And it's probably just not, not better for white. I mean, it's, it's not worse. We have the bishop pair. We have a little bit more space. But we also have a damaged pawn structure. And black has very well-placed pieces. The knights are nicely assembled on the king side. The bishop has good prospects. You know, there's this knight h5, knight f4 idea. Whereas white just doesn't have any very clear plans. And I started understanding that once his knight got to g6. A very instructive moment. Also, our opponent did seem very comfortable, as someone is saying in the chat, with like the typical plans in this position. So h3, okay. Castles. And c4, we were just making some improving moves, both of us. I think b6 is a very instructive move for newer players. Notice how our opponent is just preventing the idea of c5. You might look at this and say, well, doesn't c5 blunder a pawn? Well, it does currently, but under different circumstances, if the e5 pawn were weaker... We could very well play c5, and that could really be the difference because it could open the floodgates on the queen side. So I, I like this move from our opponent. Bishop b3. Queen e7 is just sort of a neutral move. Same with king h2. I was already preparing g3. And now the fun begins. So knight h5, g3. Again, if black plays f5, we actually have several options here. Um, if you're a, a 1d4 player with white, if, if you play the king's Indian from the white side, but also, if you play from the black side, you should be familiar with this idea, which has plagued, you know, countless Kings Indian players. And basically, what happens is that if you have a situation where you play f5 too early in the Kings Indian, very often you allow this very nasty idea with the knight coming to g5 and then coming to e6. That's actually why you sometimes see Kings Indian players go h6 to protect that square. And in the King's Indian, you often don't want to give away your light squared bishop. So that's why you don't want to allow the knight to get to e6. So translating it to our current position, you have a lot of the same themes. Knight g5 is actually a very strong move here because it hits the knight on h5. And you might find f4 to be scary, but tactically it doesn't work. You just take the knight and threaten checkmate. And black has to go back. And then you just play ef. And not only do you win a pawn, but you have this monster e6 square for the knight. As well as what I had in mind initially, which was ef5. And, and this idea, bishop f5, bishop f5, rook f5, and g4. According to the engine, black is actually not worse here. This is actually not the best way to punish black's play. Black has a very instructive idea here. Sack the exchange on f3, which is obvious because black has no other way to save material. Right? If black moves the rook, he loses the knight. So rook f3 should be obvious to you. Queen f3 is forced. And now the rook comes to f8 with tempo. And why does black have sufficient compensation for the exchange? Because black has this monster, monster square for the knight. Second main reason is because the center is closed. So the rooks just don't have any active prospects. A great example of a simple exchange sack that gives the side that sacrifices it excellent play. Queen h4 is coming. You know, the, the knight can jump into e2 in some cases. The rooks just don't have anything going for them. If you play a4, black can even take the time to close the queen side with a5 and basically keep this rook confined. So the correct move here would not be g4. The correct move here would not be e takes f5. It would actually be knight g5. So this is uh, an interesting line. I'm glad our opponent didn't play f5. He went back to f6, which I think is a great move. 
Somebody was asking, is Knight takes C5 available here? So it's a tempting move, and you should always consider it in these situations. But it doesn't tell the whole story. You can't just stop calculating here and say, oh, I'm up a pawn. Because you've given Black this monster knight on E5, and you've given Black just, like, an insane initiative on the king side. Knight G4 check is very strong here, by the way, because it roots the bishop out, and the queen is now out of commission. This is a threat. White's whole position starts to crumble here. So... So knight takes c5 is, is good, a good tactical eye, but it, it gives black just a massive initiative on the king side. Knight f6, we go knight g1. Our opponent goes knight d7, which is another great move, by the way. The knight is transferred over to c5, as it often is in the king's Indian. So let's get to the fun part of the game. We played h4, knight c5, h5. Knight f4, best move by our opponent. Massive kudos, because I came to the assumption that knight h8 was first. Now, I don't think knight h8 is a bad move. I don't think knight h8 is a bad move at all. Um, I think that I think that knight h8 is the straightforward move, but black can combine this with f5, and I don't think black is worse here. Now, I was going to play something like f3 and try to go g4 and weave a, a pawn net around the king side, but black can beat us to the punch with f5. And likely, we're going to get some sort of liquidation on the f5 square. We're going to get this position, which... I really don't think is worse for black. I would actually go so far as to say that black's position is preferable here because our pawns are bad. The king is, is kind of airy. And this knight can come around to f7 and then later to g5 and put pressure on this backward pawn on f3. So, yeah. So this entire type of position just isn't that good for white. It's like a king's Indian where you can't attack on the queen side because of the crippled pawn structure. Very instructive to, to see how black, how comfortable black is in positions where white might have a space advantage, but white has no good active plans on the queen side. So our opponent goes here. Now, the reason I played bishop c5, the reason I didn't go here, is because after queen h4 check, king g2, e takes f4. This bishop is attacked. And if we take on c5 now, then black has perpetual check. This is actually something I missed initially. This check on g5 is very easy. It's easy to forget about it. Why is it so good? Because you can't run away. You get checkmated. You have to go back to the age file, and black just keeps checking you. Obviously, blocking with the knight is just absurd here, because this square is defended twice. So you get a draw. So what I decided was to take on c5 first, bc, now to take on f4. And in this position, if black plays ef, which is exactly what happened, the bishop is no longer hanging. I've essentially snuck this move in, which gives me this extra tempo that I can now use to bring my queen into the defense. The position apparently is still equal, according to the engine. Black missed a very important attacking idea here. I think f5 was the biggest culprit. I think this is very close to being the decisive mistake, because it, it offers the bishop trade, and our opponent's idea was correct conceptually. Conceptually, the right attacking plan is to get this rook involved, because without the rook, black cannot finish the king. Again, bishop g4, queen takes f4 is a very important tactical detail. Even though the queens are in an x-ray, there is no discovery because of knight takes h3. Notice the defensive power of this knight on g1. If black checks here and then checks again, we have knight h3. And again, this is the presence of the queen on f3. Bishop g4, this had to be calculated. Queen back to g2. And white consolidates. f3, we have queen g3. And we're chilling. Queen takes h5, rook g1, and white, black is forced to trade on h3 because of the mate threat on g7. Hopefully this line makes sense. This is a very important line. So you just, you know, in these situations, you just have to calculate. There's just no way around it. By the way, if black starts with bishop g4, you could even go knight h3 anyway and counterattack the queen. So in any case, the correct idea was to go rook e8. To basically do the same thing, except without trading the bishops, because the bishop is a very important attacking asset. The idea is to lift the rook to g5 and deliver checkmate. White has to run away. So if you're watching on YouTube, see if you can figure out how to evacuate the king from g2. And I, I had carried this idea out in the actual game, so it, th this should be familiar to you. What should white do here? Which just leads to like a very complex position. Actually, this is a mistake. No, knight h3 is wrong because it walks into this move. Remember that with a king on h2, 
You could drop the queen back to g2. Here you lose the knight on h3 with mate. Rook e1 is a mistake because here, after you evacuate and black plays rook g5, it's a very instructive scenario. You can't go here because you get pinned. And so the king is kind of just stuck on f1 where it's going to be like massacred by all these moves. The correct move is rook f to c1 because take this position. Here you need to find another engine move. So let's compare this position. Yeah, this position and this position. Here the rook is on c1 and here the rook is on e1. The correct move here is e5. And I'll explain the idea in a second. If you play e5 with the rook on e1, black plays bishop g4. Now let's transition the rook to c1. Here, after e5, bishop g4, you have queen takes f4. Now you might say, well, why does this not work with the rook on e1? Well, because after rook f e1, if you do the same thing with the rook on e1 after queen takes f4, there is an insane tactic. Oh my god, this is beautiful. Look at this. In this position, black to play and win. Who can find the move? And there you will see why you actually need the rook on c1. This is unbelievably deep. Bishop e2 check is correct. But it's not the end of the line. Because, well, it is the end of the line. Bishop e2 check wins the game. If white takes with any of the three pieces I highlighted in orange, you lose the queen. White must take with a knight. But queen h3 is checkmate. Now do you see how the rook on e1 hurts white? Were the rook to be on c1, you would have the escape square king e1. This is tactical chess at its, at its finest. So if we do the same thing here, white can play knight e2 check. Queen h3 is no longer mate. And queen h1, this is the craziest thing, actually loses for black because the knight can return to g1 and open up a different escape square for the king. And the reason we put the rook on c1 and not on b1 is because... Honestly, one of the most beautiful like concepts I've seen in a while is because with the rook on b1, at the end of this line, you lose the exchange on b1. Whereas with the rook on c1, the queen is defending it. Queen is defending the c1 square. Absolute insane moment. But hopefully you followed it. I would, there is no way I would see any of that. King e2, and the queen protects the rook. White wins the game. And that is the simple reason why white has to evacuate with rook fc1. Of course, the takeaway, if you're watching this and you're a newer player like WTF, is this concept of moving the rook away and then dashing away with the king. That's kind of the general takeaway. The specific takeaway is that chess is a crazy game. And this is why tactics are so complicated, because everything boils down to these like minute tactical details that are six or seven moves into the variation. You know, which is why your calculation has to be so well developed at kind of a grandmaster tactical level. This would be a GM level problem. This would be something I'd get from my coach. He would give me an hour and he would say, choose between rook e1, rook c1, and rook b1, right? This would be a perfect example. A lot of people ask me, like, what, what do grandmasters solve? Like, this would be a good example of that, right? I'd have like 30 minutes and I'd have to choose between these three moves. So absolute, absolute insanity. And you don't necessarily learn anything from this analysis. I think it's just cool, right? Some, some things can just be appreciated. You don't have to learn from every single variation that you look at. It's okay to just have fun and enjoy something and enjoy, you know, an engine line from time to time. But the bottom line is that F5, right idea, wrong execution. Because once the bishops are traded and we go knight h3, there's no bishop g4. So although black is able to pick up another pawn, at this point, black's attack starts to fizzle out because there's just no entry points. The knight is protecting g5. The queen is protecting g4. That's it. If black plays g5, there's knight takes f4, which is another really sexy tactic, by the way, that I had to see because otherwise g4 comes really, really fast. And that's it because, okay, obviously the, the queen is hanging. Queen takes f4. The simplest is just to take the queen and then to take the rook and we're up a, or up a rook. So there's not much the black can do. He tried to get the second rook involved, but at the end of the day, like we evacuated our king, we smashed our rook into e6. This is a really nice move, by the way, using indirect defense, right? You see an idea that starts to panic you. A lot of people, I think newer players especially, would be very tempted by a move like this in time pressure and would blunder the knight away. 
or or maybe would move the knight away and blunder the rook. Remember that you have such a thing as indirect defense. The move g5 weakens the king severely. That's the first thing that I see when I look at this move. And so this idea of rook e6, it comes to me because I understand that now the g6 square is accessible potentially to our rook, and it's accessible with check. Rook f7, queen e4, the rest of the game is very straightforward. I had to see this idea, though. This is actually an only move according to the engine. This is an only winning move, queen e6, with the idea of delivering this checkmate. So this is just something that I had to see. There's no other moves because the knight is hanging. And again, you can't move the knight because you lose the rook. So that was the, the negative of dropping the king back is that the defense of the rook has been relinquished. But after queen e6, rook e5... Check here, queen g4, and the game is over. We win the knight, and the rest of the game is pretty straightforward. Queen c8 was an unnecessary finesse. Uh, the best move, according to the engine, was actually to play rook takes g4. As a matter of fact, this was the best move, because in this position, we are directly contact, making contact with the h6 pawn, as opposed to playing queen takes g4, where... You, here the rook is on g4 in that line the rook is on h4 another subtlety this is a slightly inferior version it's still winning technically because black will pick up some pawns on the queen side but as you saw in the game what i did with my last seconds is basically first i got my king involved this is a very important detail the rook is protected i got my rook involved and i just like went after him like the, once the knight gets into the game the black king is toast i mean look at all these threats and Black can, can pick up a bunch of pawns, but, but the king is going to get massacred and Black will lose more material. And that's how the game ended. I mean, my opponent could have kept resisting with king to e8. I would have probably just taken the pawn and just converted this position in kind of a boring fashion. Instead, he helped me out a little bit by giving up the rook. Knight g5, hitting the rook. Obviously, uh, king e8, knight g5 allows rook to e7. So remember this if you're defending. Blocking a check with the piece that is being targeted in a discovery. That's very often forgotten about by players who just assume, oh, this loses the rook. Like, no, you can actually use the piece that's getting attacked to block the check. And often you need to leave a certain square open for that piece. Okay, and that finished the game. King e7, knight g5, and the rest is history. Wow, so reduced time control, but I still think we got a super interesting game. I learned a lot from the opening. In the sense that d5 I thought was automatic. It's not. This actually could be considered a serious inaccuracy. So knight takes e5 for opening Andes is the move. And then, of course, very, very well played by my opponent in the first stage of the game, showing us how difficult these positions are to play. It's not about the space advantage. It's about who has the easier plan. And in this case, the side is, who has an easier plan is black with this f7, f5 idea. So that's that. We had some nice prophylactic ideas with g3. We dropped our knight back to g1, tried to execute the f4 move, but that didn't work. Just really quickly, takes takes f5, of course, was the, the reason that we, didn't, that we didn't go f4. The ability to switch plans at a moment's notice is something that I applied here with h4. Then, again, kudos to our opponent for knight f4, and then incredible complications. Relying on our calculation is obviously indispensable at this level. That's what a lot of these games just come down to. It's just pure calculation tactics. And that's the hard truth of hitting 2000 plus. Just that your positional knowledge is great. It helps you get good positions. But a lot of games are just whether you like it or not going to boil down to your ability to detect tactical finesse, which is why I keep hammering him home the importance of puzzle solving constantly and developing robust pattern recognition ability to spot details. I well, hope you enjoyed that game, guys. I'm going to hit the sack because I want to do Title Tuesday. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.